Uh, this question is for Dr. Zacharias. Um, why did you try to end your life at 17? What about Christ made you want to live on? Um, I told the story in my book, Walking from East to West. It was one of the most difficult books I ever wrote because I wrote it as really my own personal journey. Uh, my dad, highly placed individual in the government of India and the home ministry, very successful. He was a tough man, tough tempered, tough uh, in every sense of the term. Uh, extremely disciplined to have gotten to where he did. He'd done his work in industrial relations at the University of Nottingham, came back quite highly placed and uh, influential. And out of us five brothers and sisters, I was the most underperforming individual. I never made it through anything. I lived for two things. I lived for the cricket field. I lived for the tennis court. I want to play cricket. I dreamed about cricket. I drooled about cricket. I imagined cricket. And now here am I in these, all these years, having left India four decades ago, I still dream about cricket. I enjoy the game so much. It's a beautiful game, really a beautiful game. With the result, I concentrated very little on my studies. My life could be described as punctuated failure. That's what it was, punctuated failure. And in my book, I tell the story one day of uh, taking the most severe thrashing from my dad. It's the way they knew how to do it. It was the time and culture in which they felt this is how they change you. I'm not blaming him. I'm just telling you it's the way it was. If my mother hadn't intervened, I think some bones would have been broken. The results would have been very costly. I was a very slender kid, small kid, and my dad really took it out on me that day. And the more I pondered this, I thought to myself, why? What's all this about anyway? You know, if you don't like the way you feel, why do you want to keep on feeling? And if I could describe it in one sentence, I really didn't want to feel anymore. Because what I felt, I didn't like. And I took uh, from the science lab some poisons and tried to end it all, very, very nearly succeeded. I mentioned the fact that in India this happens quite often. My closest friend had doused himself with kerosene and burned himself to death because he had not succeeded in the exam. We live with that tension. Things are slightly changed, but the most suicide-rich year, time of the year is when uh, the results are out at universities. When I came to know Christ, I wanted to put life together. There are four questions in life for all of us. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Where do I come from? What gives life meaning? How do I differentiate between good and bad? What happens to a human being when he or she dies? Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. You have to find answers that are correspondingly true to each of these questions and all put together, it has to cohere. There has to be coherence in this. There has to be a skin that pulls it all together. In reading John's Gospel, I couldn't read it actually. The gentleman who brought the Bible to me lives about 10 miles from here, but he himself is very close to the end of his life. I wanted so much to bring him here. I spoke to him on the phone about two months away. He said, please let me come, please let me come. But his situation is so weak right now. And he often said to me, on the phone he said to me that day, just after Christmas, he said, sometimes I think I came into this world just to be able to give you a Bible. Just to be able to give you a Bible. And that transformed my life as I walked out of there. John chapter 14 was read to me. Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. If I can take a tail end to this, Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. I knew it wasn't biological life. I trusted in him with the little prayer that I prayed and walked out of there and followed up with it with men and women who could teach me the scriptures and life change. One by one, the rest of the family, including my father, mother, all became followers of Christ. Even though we'd come from a priestly background, we'd lost the message of Christ somewhere along the way. When my mother died in her 50s, my dad asked me if I would preach at her funeral in Toronto. I struggled with it. Then he said at the graveside, he said, son, what would you want to put on her gravestone? I said, at the verse that she first read to me without even knowing what it meant. So he put John 14, 19, Jesus said, because I love you, you shall live also. That was in 1974. In the 1990s, my wife and I, my wife's from Canada, went into Delhi. She said, can I see your grandmother's grave? You talk so much about remembering as a little boy going to that funeral. I said, honey, I don't know if you can find it. 
I tracked it down, went to the only Christian cemetery in Delhi, went to the registrar, found the register, tracked it down, tracked it down, tracked it down, find out, found out I was only nine years old in the mid-50s when she had passed away. Walked over to the plot, there was nothing visible. I hired a gardener with a shovel. I said, I'll be happy to pay you. Please dig this soil and find the stone. So he's digging and digging and digging, and all of a sudden he strikes a stone. So he's gently moving it away, pouring water, moving it away, pouring water. And all of a sudden the words begin to emerge. The name of my grandmother, the date of her birth, date of her death, and then these words. Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also, John 14, 19. The verse that brought me to him, that's on my mother's grave, was originally put on my grandmother's grave about something about which none of us as a family actually knew. The threads all came together. When Jesus came into my life, he didn't change what I did. Merely, he changed what I want to do. And I must tell you, because my father, if he were here, would tell me, he passed away, he said, tell him this truth too. I left from the bottom of the class to the top of the class after I came to know Christ and never left the top. Prior to that, my father used to say, my father used to say, center forward in football and fullback in studies. He never said that afterwards. So that's part of the story. Yeah. <laughs> Um, at the far microphone. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much for being here. I'm a, a long-time listener, a big fan of both of uh, your work, rather your ministry. Thank you very much. Um, back to the, uh, the topic of uh, in, intolerance, um, I wonder if you care to um, kind of uh, d discuss uh, intolerance on the personal level versus intolerance on like the institutional level, because it seems that Intolerance on the, the, the personal level, it's like, oh, okay, you know, I can walk away and I won't see that person again, and that's, that's that. But when it gets into the, uh, the institutions, whatever that may be, whether it's, you know, the local Rotary Club or <laughs> the government or anything like that, you know, quite a hierarchy, I just uh, wonder if you care to discuss that a little bit. Yes, and I think, and Michael, please feel free to pitch in here. My response would be fairly brief on that. I have found no better way than to sit down with the people, institutions. Evil does not run through the heart of institutions. It runs through the heart of people, men and women. It doesn't go through states or governments or organizations. It runs through the heart of every man and every woman. If I find somehow that there is something dishonorable here, I'll sit down and talk to the individual. Go and see the powers that be. The best you can do is voice and say, look, this is what's happening. I don't think this is right. I don't think this is fair. If the reverse were done, I don't think you would tolerate it very much either. So I ask you, sir or ma'am, would you please consider looking into this subject and changing the reality for us who feel victimized by an institutional pattern here? And I'll be most grateful to you. Thank you for just giving me these few minutes of talking to you. You build that relationship gradually but you never do it by lawlessness or anarchy or rudeness or disrespect. You do it by drawing the best instincts out of people. And I have found some of the toughest of them change just by a period of relationship. Whenever I go into and stay in any hotel where I go to and race, I'll always go and ask to meet the manager. I'll go and meet the front desk person. I'll go and meet the maitre d', introduce myself as I'm here for the week. I look forward to enjoying this hotel and so on. And you know what? Through the middle of the week, they'll come to you and ask you if there's anything they can do, anything they can serve you in. It works that way even in institutions. Befriend the powers that be, and you'll be surprised how some of them will open up and say, even though this is not what I would like to do, I respect for you, I will do it. This gets more serious in academic subjects, theses, dissertations. You can find yourself being marked out because you're not sharing the ideas that one wants to share. You just have to be wise how you move in this and uh, endure the tedious journey. And you do it in an honorable way in the end, you will find truth will win out. Mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, doc, Dr. Amston, um, is, would you have anything to add? Um, I mean, I may have been interpreting your question slightly differently, um, but when it comes to tolerance at an institutional level, I think, uh, I know certainly in Europe, we've got ourselves in a little bit of a confusion here. Uh, I got a letter from the British Home Office, which is the, well, it used to be called the Home Office, um, 
which deals with justice. Part of its things in the British political system, it looks after the police force, looks after the law courts. And they used to have a little motto that said, breeding, uh, building a free, just, and tolerant society. And I can remember the first time seeing that logo thinking, I, I have a feeling that only two out of these three are possible. Um, and let me just explain to you what I mean by that. Um, the way tolerance, the word tolerance has come to be defined today, uh, uh, we, we're not quite sure exactly what it means. Either it means, well, we just accept and agree with everybody. But historically, that wouldn't be right. And in, in the past, when you talked about tolerating someone, the first thing you're assuming is you disagree with them. Because you don't tolerate what you agree with, right? I mean, if you agree with someone, you're not tolerating them, you're agreeing with them. But if you disagree with them, then you're actually passing judgment. Now, I think what you're saying is wrong, and that could be morally or intellectually or whatever way, but you feel that it's important for you to, to allow that other position, even though you personally disagree with it. Um, but when you talk about justice, um, and justice being upheld and enforced in a society, you're not normally asking for tolerance to be exercised. So in a rape case that's argued before a judge, for a judge to rule at the end of the rape case, well, we caught the guy and he's definitely guilty, but you know, we just have to tolerate these kinds of things. They just happen. And we've had laws against rape for hundreds of years and we've never eradicated it. So we just have to learn to deal with it. Um, at that point, we, we, we have a, it would seem to me a contradiction potentially there, which I think most people would instantly react against. The, the other problem we also have with tolerance um, is uh, most of us think of it positively today. Tolerance is a good thing even though most of us actually define it negatively. So, I mean, I'm only in LA just for a very short time. Um, you know, so I arrive this afternoon, I leave tomorrow morning, and then, and then I'm going to, uh, uh, to Cairo, which will probably be my last speaking engagement this year. And um, <laughs> I, so, so, so just imagine you hear that I'm just briefly in town, you come to me and say, Michael, you're only in LA just for a few hours, and would like to extend some hospitality to you, let me, take you to the very best restaurant here in LA, and obviously for that kind of invitation, I'd extend my, my sleeping hours beyond. It's now 5 a.m. in England. I mean, I'll be happy to be step. Actually, we can have breakfast together. And, <laughs> I, and I accept your kind invitation, and the next morning, you hear me talking to a friend of yours. Um, you're standing behind me, I can't see you. And your friend says to me, I, I hear someone took you out to LA's nicest restaurant last night. Did you enjoy meeting them? And I say, yeah, they were tolerable. If you heard that, would you be, would you be happy? They say, yeah, did you enjoy the food? And I say, I could tolerate it. <laughs> it's very interesting. We, we talk about tolerance, but I know very few people in this world who want to be tolerated, but I know a lot of people who want to be respected. But here's the key thing, because I said the idea of tolerance, freedom, and justice, maybe only two of those are possible. I'm not sure... In that sense, our common acceptance of the definition of tolerance today is even compatible with freedom. In the sense that if that is the way we're now going to take tolerance, we just simply accept what anyone says, we need to understand, therefore, that's also the end of all free society and all free discussion. Because you cannot tolerate someone and disagree with them. Because at the point of disagreement, if it just does mean acceptance, you're no longer tolerating them. But you can respect someone and disagree with them. And since the means by which we find to be able to disagree with one another over certain issues becomes foundational to all civilized society. I'm wondering whether at times, rather than having huge debates about what tolerance is or isn't, we should begin to ask what actually does it mean to treat other people with respect? Because I desperately want to live in a society where we learn to respect one another as individuals, even though we may disagree at, certain other, uh, at the level of ideas. There you go, I'm going to sleep now. <laughs> Uh, we'll take another live question over at the other microphone. This question is for both speakers. Um, if the transformative power of Jesus Christ is so great and um, it's the only way to live an abundant life and to never thirst again, um, how can we do not see more Christians living this transformed, abundant, spirit-filled life? Uh, That's a really good question. If you would like to give me a name, a list of names and addresses of all the hypocrites you know, <laughs> I, um, 
We'll be happy to go and pay some visits. I, I think your question is a very fair one. I think, as a matter of fact, I think it's more than fair. I, I want to be careful how I, how I phrase this um, because uh, I am part of, I'm part of the church. That's part of my identity um, ever since I myself became a Christian. But it does seem that the Bible has some very challenging words for the church. And as a matter of fact, just before coming up here, I was just reading through um, a speech uh, that Martin, uh, Martin, um, uh, Martin King Dr. Martin Luther King gave. Um, is that right? That's right. And, um, sorry, I'm in America, right? So I'm in the right country. <laughs> Just checking. And when he was put in prison, um, he very famously wrote a letter from prison, uh, which is a very impressive letter to read his letter from Birmingham jail. Uh, all the more impressive when you remember he, he wrote that letter from memory. And I always knew he was a political activist and I knew various things about him. I had no idea how well read he was. And you can always tell something about someone when, when they're writing a letter um, and they're making reference both to philosophy and to law and to theology. And he does it so well. But part of his letter, and I think it's something that needs to be heard today, is he says, we're living in America where the church is espousing one thing with its lips, but it's not living it with its life. He says, and therefore, he says, we are breeding a generation of people who've absolutely lost faith in the church, many of them losing faith in America as a country. And he shudders to think of the violence it may hold and the division it may cause in the United States of America as it went forward from that point. And he ends his letter with the words along the lines of, and now God's judgment rests on the church as never before. And I pray it may raise up in this divisive hour, decisive hour, and its voice may be heard. And what's more importantly, that it may actually live the moral values which it espouses. And so I think um, there has to be a challenge. And I think the scripture is very challenging to Christians about the way in which we live and the means by which we live and the values by which we live. And I'm going to have to confess that I think in the Western church, we've excused ourselves from a lot of that and we've claimed comfort and convenience as being the highest ethic uh, rather than the principle of laying down your life in service for others. We're expecting everyone to lay down their lives in service to us. And that can't possibly be right. I think Ravi G would, would probably agree and, uh, with us and say, I know my experience is when I'm visiting, when I'm with the church in very poor parts of the world, when I'm visiting the church in parts of the world where you can be killed for simply becoming a Christian. The church I meet there is often very beautiful, very attractive, very humble, and very clear, both in its message and in its lifestyle. Uh, but our affluence seems to have choked the purity of that message. And so I think we need, if you like, a challenge to, to the church. And if you are a Christian here today, I think maybe one of the challenges, since we're talking about tolerance, would be that we are called to live a thoroughly uncompromised life. Now, it's maybe sad that when most people in this room, if you were to close your eyes and imagine a thoroughly uncompromised Christian, someone who was totally uncompromising in their Christian faith, we would immediately think of someone who was very harsh, very difficult, and very unpleasant to spend time with. But the Bible invites us to pass judgment on everyone who claims to be a Christian. And part of that judgment, we're told, is to look at the fruit of their life. And the fruit of their life, we're told, for everyone who claims to follow Christ, should be love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, and so on. So let's be thoroughly uncompromising about that. Let's just make sure that in no area of our life are we compromised in such that our lives are sending a message that will be inconsistent with the fruit that we're told to bear, to bear as Christians. So... I think we may need to fall in love all over again with what it actually means to be a Christian, if you indeed are. And if you're not a Christian, if you've been put off by Christians, please don't reject the possibility of, of genuine life change and what it genuinely means to follow him because you've encountered a few fakes. And uh, it seems, especially in America, there's a lot of money to be made um, by faking it. 
Um, indeed, one friend I know who was training for the ministry said here, people will give a lot of money to authenticity, and if you can fake that, you've got it made. <laughs> and, um, and maybe we just need to be maybe a little bit more, I think we do need to be more challenging with ourselves and also as members of the church with the church to say, do, does this look like Jesus said it should look like? We have a lot of people lined up at the microphone, so I think we'll just try to keep things moving and answer as many questions as we can. Um, over at the other microphone. Great. Well, uh, I'd first like to thank both of you. I came here today on a whim, and I'm certainly glad I did. Um, so this question is focusing on Dr. Zacharias's uh, talk today, but you're both certainly welcome to answer. Um, it, as I understand it, and I hope that this hasn't been too reductionist of me, uh, You've noticed three main trends, those, fo those focusing on secularism, pluralism, and privatization. Um, and the one that I find particularly interesting is the role between secularism and a loss of shame in society and the, impl the implications that that could have. Uh, where, where I guess I see uh, the most tenuous link is the possibility of totally secular societies or a faithless society still having a shame culture is still having a moral basis um, from a, uh, some other foundation uh, of moral understanding. Um, I'd just like to hear from both of you what role you think faith has, uh, what role the church has in maintaining morality, and uh, if there is the possibility for that's still like, moral reasoning in the absence of faith. The most important word, I think, that we need to bear in mind <clears throat> is that the word sacred ought to define what morality means. Because Jesus Christ really did not come into this world to make bad people good. He came into this world to make dead people live. Moral rectitude and moral uprightness can be held by many, but if a person in themselves think I'm morally so good that I really don't need God, it's the most seductive form of morality which ultimately leads you into some kind of arrogance or self-aggrandizement. <clears throat> I remember yesterday, Professor Lowenstein and I, when we were in conversation, he made the comment that humility is the characteristic he sees so lacking in our society right now. <clears throat> and when you're humble before God, you recognize the need to be transformed. You recognize the need that you cannot pull yourself on, you're up by your own moral bootstraps. Every major religion of the world, I want you to hear me clearly now. <clears throat> Every major religion of the world is a works religion. Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Sikhism, Baha'ism, Jainism, all of them. You can take every one of them, it has to do with works. In, the, in Islam, your, your entrance into paradise is dictated by your good deeds outweighing your bad deeds. In Hinduism, every birth is a rebirth and it's on the basis of karma, all that went on before. And your karmic cycle keeps going till you can break off this cycle and attain nirvana, or moksha, or whatever they want to call it. In the Christian faith, you first of all come, not by virtue of moral capacity, you come by the gift and the grace of God who offers you forgiveness and you come just as you are in all of your failings. When the prodigal son comes home in that tremendous parable, it is so counterintuitive within Eastern culture. This boy took the father's money, spent it at a whim, plundered his life, did everything wrong, and he's gone. And now he decides he's going to come home. In Eastern culture, the father would never go out. He's been wronged. He would have to wait till the son came and literally threw himself at his feet and begged for mercy. But in the way Jesus tells the story, the Eastern father would have immediately sort of perked up his ears. The father leaves the porch, leaves the home, runs towards the son and embraces him and receives him. This my son was lost, is found, was dead, is alive. So morality is good living, is the fruit of your conversion and your commitment to Christ. It is not the means of your attaining uh, salvation and attaining rightness in the sight of God. So what are the Ten Commandments all about? They were all about the fact that life is sacred, your word is sacred, your marriage is sacred, your time is sacred, your giving is sacred. And in the sanctity of life, these expressions come. But the Ten Commandments came 
after the Exodus. Redemption precedes righteousness. It is never the other way around. So God takes a life, puts that life back together, and gives you the fruit of what Michael was talking about. What does the church have to do here? I think the church has to teach us that that inner transformation is desperately needed. Let me say this very carefully. Listen to me carefully now. Malcolm Muggeridge said, the depravity of man is at once the most empirically verifiable fact at the same time that it is the most intellectually resisted. The depravity of man is the most empirically verifiable fact at the same time it's most intellectually resisted. If a man is stealing nuts and bolts from a railway track, says Dale Moody, and you send him to university at the end of his education, he will steal the whole railway track. Some of the biggest crimes that have been committed against humanity sometimes have been committed by high offices and high success stories. Depravity is here. Transformation, redemption, righteousness, and worship. That's the sequence. Morality alone will never get any one of us anywhere. It may make for some kind of existence, but it doesn't deal with the root of the problem, which is the rebellious heart that needs to be corrected and the heart that needs to humble itself before God. That's my word to you. One of the most thrilling aspects of RZM is Wellspring International. Many of you are familiar with it. It's the humanitarian arm of what we do. And Wellspring this last year had done several major projects. Among them was Zamar Academy, the school for children from the so-called lowest class and unable to support themselves. How much was accomplished by Wellspring procuring the land and beginning the building. These kids now can get an education that'll help them qualify all the way into higher education because of the leadership of Wellspring and the vision. And then there was Agni Raksha, the burn victims uh, project that Wellspring had in Bangalore, women who'd been burned with all kinds of abuse and the various units that were planted and built because of Wellspring. Your generosity made it possible. Thank you for standing with us. Please continue doing that as Wellspring reaches out the hands of Christ, apologetics with a touch, bringing the rescue of God to the hurting of this world. I'd just like to hear from both of you what role you think faith has, uh, what role the church has in maintaining morality, and uh, if there is the possibility for that's still like moral reasoning in the absence of faith. The most important word I think that we need to bear in mind <clears throat> is that the word sacred ought to define what morality means. Because Jesus Christ really did not come into this world to make bad people good. He came into this world to make dead people live. Moral rectitude and moral uprightness can be held by many. But if a person in themselves think I'm morally so good that I really don't need God, it's the most seductive form of morality which ultimately leads you into some kind of arrogance or self-aggrandizement. <clears throat> I remember yesterday... Professor Lowenstein and I, when we were in conversation, he made the comment that humility is the characteristic he sees so lacking in our society right now. <clears throat> and when you're humble before God, you recognize the need to be transformed. You recognize the need that you cannot pull yourself on. You're up by your own moral bootstraps. Every major religion of the world, I want you to hear me clearly now, <clears throat> every major religion of the world is a works religion. Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Sikhism, Baha'ism, Jainism, all of them. You can take every one of them, it has to do with works. In, the, in Islam, your, your entrance into paradise is dictated by your good deeds outweighing your bad deeds. In Hinduism, every birth is a rebirth and it's on the basis of karma, all that went on before. And your karmic cycle keeps going till you can break off this cycle and attain nirvana, moksha, or whatever they want to call it. In the Christian faith, you first of all come not by virtue of moral capacity. You come by the gift and the grace of God who offers you forgiveness and you come just as you are in all of your failings. When the prodigal son comes home in that tremendous parable, it is so 
counterintuitive with an Eastern culture. This boy took the father's money, spent it at a whim, plundered his life, did everything wrong, and he's gone. And now he decides he's going to come home. In Eastern culture, the father would never go out. He's been wronged. He would have to wait till the son came and literally threw himself at his feet and begged for mercy. But in the way Jesus tells the story, the Eastern father would have immediately sort of perked up his ears. The father leaves the porch, leaves the home, runs towards the son and embraces him and receives him. This my son was lost, is found, was dead, is alive. So morality is good living, is the fruit of your conversion and your commitment to Christ. It is not the means of your attaining uh, salvation and attaining rightness in the sight of God. So what are the Ten Commandments all about? They were all about the fact that life is sacred, your word is sacred, your marriage is sacred, your time is sacred, your giving is sacred. And in the sanctity of life, these expressions come. But the Ten Commandments came after the Exodus. Redemption precedes righteousness. It is never the other way around. So God takes a life, puts that life back together, and gives you the fruit of what Michael was talking about. What does the church have to do here? I think the church has to teach us that that inner transformation is desperately needed. Let me say this very carefully. Listen to me carefully now. Malcolm Muggeridge said, the depravity of man is at once the most empirically verifiable fact at the same time that it is the most intellectually resisted. The depravity of man is the most empirically verifiable fact at the same time it's most intellectually resisted. If a man is stealing nuts and bolts from a railway track, says Dale Moody, and you send him to university at the end of his education, he will steal the whole railway track. Some of the biggest crimes that have been committed against humanity sometimes have been committed by high offices and high success stories. Depravity is here. Transformation, redemption, righteousness, and worship. That's the sequence. Morality alone will never get any one of us anywhere. It may make for some kind of existence, but it doesn't deal with the root of the problem, which is the rebellious heart that needs to be corrected and the heart that needs to humble itself before God. That's my word to you. Um, What do you say to those who cannot believe in God because suffering exists and cannot believe that a good God would allow suffering? I'd say that's a very good question. Uh, Well, maybe just a couple of things, um, because that's the kind of question that actually demands a very long answer. Um, It might be the case for some people that when suffering comes, it's not simply the case that it may drive them away from God per se. It may simply be a catalyst that reveals to them what they actually thought about God in the first place. So if you find yourself caught up in suffering, you may... For some people, they'll find themselves driven into the arms of God because they believe he's there and he cares. And to others, to walk away from the idea of God because they believe either he isn't there or he doesn't care. And so sometimes suffering simply acts as that catalyst. Um, Let me suggest um, three possible things to turn to if you're interested. Um, One of my colleagues, um, Vince Vitale, who is at Oxford, who's a philosopher who teaches with us, has done his whole doctorate on suffering. Um, and he gave a very brilliant talk um, on the nature of suffering at Oxford University in quite a hostile setting and handled q and It's available online, and I'm sure if you got in contact with our ministry at rzim.org, we could give you the link. Another one of my colleagues also at Oxford, who's a professor of mathematics, was speaking down in New Zealand shortly after the earthquake there, which devastated the city. He stood in a ruined building um, addressing members who'd, uh, people who'd all lost family members in that great tragedy and try to address the, the problem there on ground zero. And I also know that uh, Dr. Zacharias is also, uh, uh, the, all the way back to the time he was, when you were in Columbine High School, um, I know there was a whole series of talks recorded there, one of which was simply why. Um, so I think I'll try to say two things. I'd like to try to say that there's some hope, um, not just simply existentially in terms of finding comfort with God, but maybe even coming to know that there is God through it. 
Um, and you know, if you're interested, um, that question itself probably deserves a much longer answer that could simply be stated here. Um, and if that is your question, you happen to be here, I'm sure we'll be happy to put you in contact with the resources. Uh, I think we can make you a promise and say if you're not a Christian um, and you are wrestling with this issue, then we would like to give you those resources for free. Um, if you are a Christian and you want those resources, you may be tempted to have a small crisis of faith right now. <laughs> <laughs> and claim those resources for free. And to you, we'd just like to remind you there will be a day of judgment and accountability. <laughs> So those aren't for you. Um, uh, well, Michael, I'll take two quick stabs at that. <clears throat> Michael was an answer to prayer for long suffering for many, many years. Yeah, We travel together and he keeps us all entertained. <clears throat> His wife has only two words all the time while we travel. It's, oh, Michael, <laughs> oh, Michael. And then he comes one after another. There's two sides to that question. Let me just defang it philosophically and then move quickly to the application. Vince and I are in the process of writing a book together on this. He's just sent me an outline. So that's what I was doing actually last week, Bangkok Tech, doing my three chapter share of that. Philosophically, it's often of course put in tandem with evil. Suffering, evil, suffering, evil. Why does God even allow evil? And I've often responded that it's very critical to understand the nature of the question. Because when we say there's evil, we assume there's good. When we say there's good, we assume there's a moral law on the basis of which to differentiate between good and evil. When we assume a moral law, we assume a moral law giver. Because without the moral law giver, there's no moral law. Without the moral law, there's no good. Without good, there's no evil. The question actually ends up uh, hoisting itself on its own petard, as it were. It doesn't know how to defend itself. But here's the killer point of that argument. Somebody may say, why do you need a moral law giver to have a moral law? And the answer is very clear in this. Every question raised about evil and suffering is either raised by a person or about a person, which means personal worth is essential to the question. Intrinsic worth is essential to the question. And in a naturalistic framework, you cannot have intrinsic worth. Intrinsic worth. You've got extrinsic worth. It's conveyed to you. You're just a, a radar blip on the radar screen of time. You just happen to be here. But if you're a person created in the image of God with intrinsic worth, then the question indeed is reflective of the value that you give to personhood. So two things, the reality of good and the intrinsic worth of a person are essential to the question. If the question is to be untaken seriously, those two assumptions need to be made which the Christian makes. But the two points of application I want to make is this. You know, I've lived with serious back problems. That's why it's easier for me to stand also, not just keep seated. With two metal rods in my back and eight screws bolting me down from L3 to S1 from a back injury that I suffered. I've had perfect health in every other way. 40 years of travel, I've never had an upset stomach in 40 years in 70 different countries. No issues of any kind. Those things don't bother me. Yeah, I was raised on the streets of Delhi. My mother said he ate everything and nothing ever, <clears throat> ever bothered him. And there was a kind of place where if you went to eat and you spit in the sink afterwards, somebody would tell you, if you went to a distinguished restaurant and did that, what would they tell you? You would tell them I did go there and they told me if I wanted to do that to come here. So this is the kind of uh, food we ended up eating in those kind of settings. Now, what I want to say is this, through pain, through enduring pain for 27 years, constant pain for 27 years, with three herniated discs and stenosis, going, pain going down your leg, you can easily say, Lord, you've called me to travel. You've called me to do this. Why did you give me a body such as this? I have learned what Annie Johnston Flint said, who lived with cancer, blindness, arthritis of the rheumatoid kind, and she was orphaned. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials is multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundaries known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. God sustains you. God empowers you. God enables you, 
and you draw closer through many of those times of agony. And the one thought I leave with you is this. There's a young gal in Georgia by the name of Ashlyn Blocker. She was featured in a Google picture this last week, and I think Katie Couric is interviewing the parents again. When the baby was born, the mother realized something was wrong because the baby didn't cry. The doctors never diagnosed anything. Everything was fine. Till they found out she had SEPA, congenital insensitivity to pain with anhydrosis. She doesn't feel any pain. No pain whatsoever. She could step on a nail, she could put a hand on a burner and not know that her hand is being burned. The mother ended her last interview, the last time I saw when the little gal was only about 10 or 12. She said, every night I go to bed saying, God, please give my little girl the ability to feel pain. In our finite world, if pain is an indicator of something that is wrong and gets us to seek the reality of finding help, is, is it impossible in the infinite mind of God to use the agency of pain through which to draw us and to bring us to the ultimate corrective. The greatest pain is ultimately that of the soul and the separation from God. So he is able to sustain you both in the physical and emotional struggles and in the deepest pain of all, that spiritual alienation. I'll leave that with you. Uh, at this time, I think we'll be taking our last question, unfortunately, um, and we'll do it over here at the, at the microphone. Uh, don't worry, I'll keep this brief. Um, well, I really ex respect what you're doing, but um, I just, uh, coming here out of, uh, out of a whim, um, I was just curious, um, you speak of uh, tolerance and you know, respectful discourse, and I really want to believe in that, but um, I was just curious as to your opinion on um, you know, having a what we could say as a respectful discourse as far as like um, LGBT rights and stuff like that where it seems like a certain ideology would be very, have a strong conviction on that and I want to know what would be a good way for, to get a good respectful conversation going for more progress in that regard. Um, I mean, this has become obviously a very big issue partly because, well, I, mean, I think for a whole a variety of reasons, and it certainly isn't helped by the shrill voices on both sides of the debate who actually make having any kind of discourse or conversation uh, even harder. Um, I think, I mean, I'm aware a little bit, when I was speaking last in the US um, at Texas A&M in December, uh, these uh, questions came up and I had some quite extended conversations for two, three hours after the meeting with a certain group of people, also, they'll discuss, talk about it with me, and this is this is issue they wanted to discuss with me. And I think the question which uh, American society has before it right now is, is twofold. One, who informs the moral convictions of a society, and, and where do they come from? Now, historically, in the States, you've been very heavily influenced by the Christian faith and by the Judeo-Christian ethic. And what seems to be happening now is a question of whether that's actually the ethic that American society wants to embrace and, and to have. So that is going to, that's, that's going to be a conversation which is going to have to happen here, I guess, both politically as well as within academia and with every level of society. And I think that level, that conversation should be encouraged. I think the next question will then be, what does it mean to, to have... Um, uh, disagreement and within a civil society, how do you allow that kind of diversity? Now, what I do find interesting about the debate um, uh, is this. Both in ancient Greece and in Rome, in those societies, homosexual relationships were seen as being purer and higher than heterosexual ones. So the culture as a large had the conviction that Homosexual love was of a purer and nobler form than heterosexual relationship. And even if you were married, um, having a homosexual relationship on the side was seen as being, well, and, and openly was being seen perfectly acceptable. And in some cases, some of the leaders in those societies would have been openly uh, gay and I would have been applauded for it. What I do find interesting, however, is both in ancient Greece and in Rome, there was never any debate about changing the meaning of marriage, for example. So marriage was still classically understood. Um, but even though you know, homosexual, views, uh, homosexual relationships were viewed, as I say, as being on a, 
on a more noble plane. So where I find the debate more, more concerning is using legislative force to start changing the meaning of words in the dictionary. That, that, that is something I find uh, more concerning, and history doesn't seem to tell a very happy story of any society that resorts to legislative force to start rewriting the meaning of words. So I'm wondering if there are ways for, for this conversation to happen in a way that will take place, uh, in a way that will allow uh, that, uh, you know, as I say, um, people to be able to say on both sides what they actually believe <clears throat> and where they think they may be wrong and then, and then to find a way to, for the, as a society to live that together. Um, in Europe, we're having similar types of debates and it's getting, it's getting complicated. Um, uh, in France and in Germany, there have been debates about uh, what, 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 how much surgery should be allowed within a gay couple to allow them to have uh, babies and to actually to conceive if they're both men, uh, because the technology is there now, but obviously it's very expensive to, to do that. Should that be permitted or not? And should the taxpayer have to pay for it? And you can imagine these kinds of debates are the kinds of debates that raise a very high temperature in the room. So I think if there's anything that can be done that will both defuse the temperature but also allow an actual discussion of the fundamental issues which are involved, I think they'll become very, I think they'll become very important. Um, another one of our colleagues, Os Guinness, I know in the book that Dr. Ravi um, referred to earlier, which talks about what we mean by civil society and freedom, I think has some very pertinent things to say into that particular issue in debate, and, and I, uh, uh, you know, I feel comfortable with everything that he says there, and I would recommend it to be read. Um, I, mean, I don't know if there's much more that you would want <clears> to say. I'd like to answer that, and Michael, if I may make a closing statement at that time and then turn it back to you. I want to thank you for that question, <clears throat> and I know in an audience like this there'll be many, many diverse views, certainly polarizing views on it, and so if you're here tonight of a different view and you hold to that firmly, I want to thank you for coming, I want to thank you for giving us a hearing, because it must take a lot of uh, every ounce of your own strength to be seated there listening to maybe a worldview that you're not comfortable with, because it may challenge some of... Um, your own worldview or however you want to live your life out. I make a plea in a couple of directions along with what Michael, you know, our team is based in about 10 countries and we cover a lot of territory here with politicians, with business people, with academics, and politicians are beside themselves. They really have no answers. One of the political leaders in Africa put his arm in mine after I'd finished addressing the presidents there. He said, our cumulative wisdom is unable to meet the daunting challenges of our time. Our cumulative wisdom is unable to meet the daunting challenges of our time. But I want to say this, what we saw on the fiscal cliff is minor compared to what we would see in an amoral cliff if we ever get to the top there. It'll be the devastation of so much. We go in many hostile settings, many inimical settings. I go in places where I've literally had to have armed guards who are there in case anything happens. I've always made a plea in the following way. The Christian view of marriage that Michael and I would hold is very different to the Islamic view of marriage. In the Quran, polygamy is provided for and allowed for. And it is mandated by their rules, but you can have polygamous, a polygamous marriage. My own view of that is going back 5,000 years with Abraham, that became one of the factors in which it has created 5,000 years of turmoil in what happened in that household by virtue of what happened in that polygamous relationship and the offspring and the blood that has been spilled for 5,000 years started as a war between two half-brothers over who had the right to the, to the father's inheritance and uh, spiritual inheritance and so on. But that has not kept Muslim people from inviting me to speak there. Michael is heading out to Cairo next week. This year I was in so many Islamic countries and I've been, I was in, I've been in Islamic universities, the Islamic University of Malaysia, one of the oldest Islamic universities with the sheikh sitting in front of me for a one and a half hour open forum. I have a differing view on the sanctity of marriage to theirs, but they allow us to come and speak. Same with Buddhists. Buddhist monks have a different view of marriage than the Christian does. So also um, with the Catholic uh, teaching on celibacy in the ministry, we don't hold to that as uh, um, Protestant, uh, evangelical Christians and so on. 
But that does not keep them from inviting us. We go and speak and cordially we discuss, we disagree, and if we disagree, we do so not compromising our convictions. We'll speak in any, any settings. I spoke at the Mormon Tabernacle, the first uh, non-Mormon to be invited there in 104 years after D.L. Moody to speak at that. I don't hold to their view of marriage and so on. We, we well know that, but we respectfully deal with that. So my plea with the skeptic in these matters is, can we not still talk? Can we not still hear one another? Can you not give the Christian the chance to defend what it is about the sanctity of marriage that we actually see and why it is we hold that view? And wherever society ultimately goes in an open arena of question, truth will ultimately triumph. Truth will win out and the lie will be shown for what it really is. We are committed to be followers of Christ and we will preach his word and I thank you for giving us that opportunity. Let me just close with this simple illustration. <clears throat> Last year, after 40 years of travel, I experienced something that I hadn't experienced in a long time. I was invited to preach at the Angola prison in Louisiana, which has 5,300 hardcore prisoners. 85% of them are on life without parole. 45 of them are on death row. And you walk in and see 22, 23 year old men who will never leave the prison, never walk out of there. And they jammed the auditorium when I was there to speak and address the issue of grace and forgiveness and redemption. When you walk past death row, you just go by there and they'll reach their hand out and they will grab your hand and ask you to pray for them. The chaplain, the, the warden who was there, a man by the name of Burl Kane, the girth of a southern sheriff, he walks like that, you know. <laughs> he told the prison that he would come if they would let him do it his way. It was the bloodiest prison in the country. Blood marks on the walls, blood marks on the carpets. When you were checked in, you were given a knife to defend yourself. Today, it's the safest prison in the United States after a few years of Burl Kane being there. Bible verses all over the wall all over the wall. And in the, just before these guys go into the ante room for the last meal, before they go to the execution, I'll never be the same after seeing that execution chamber. I could not handle it. When they tell you the stories of what happens, they just walk away from it. But I'll never forget sitting at that table, thinking what must go through the mind of a man as he's about to go to the execution table. But I looked up at the wall and there was a painting painted by a prisoner of Daniel in the lion's den. I said, who painted that? The warden said, a prisoner. I said, why? He said, he painted it telling the man about to be executed. You could still be rescued. Don't give up. And then I said, what if it doesn't happen? He said, look at that wall. Elijah with his chariots of fire, taking the person to be with his creator. And so the artist who was in prison said, if you're not rescued this way, you will be rescued that way. In every cell is a Bible. And the chaplain and somebody said, if we had more of these in our schools and our colleges, we'd need less of these in our prisons. The transformation of these minds and the men. When I left there, I got into the plane and we were silent, the five of us, silent. We just saw how tragic life can be but what redemption can actually do, the transformation of a life. And that, only God is big enough to do that. And I pray if you've never come that way to him, you'll give him a chance in your life. And if you're an honest skeptic, keep hungering. For the Bible says, you shall search for me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. I hope we have the privilege of coming back here again. My thanks to everybody in the Veritas Forum for organizing and putting this together.